presentations or at least commentaries on how we have been developing um, into this program over the past uh, two years in the planning phases. You've heard a presentation from DCMO BOCES folks on their career destinations program and how that will be integrated into this greater program and we are now proud to say that we are in year one of implementation and so Crystal is going to give us um, some background and an update and answer any questions that you might have on our future focused career experience program. So this is the Delaware Academy Center School District Future Focused Career Experience Program. Um, and it's primary hinged on work-based learning, job shadowing, and internships, as well as other college readiness programs. It's great to get. So it's always good to have some historical background to, to look at and evaluate where we're at and where we're going from where we came from. So a little history of the DA Future Focused Career Experience Program is that it all started with a senior seminar, which was a class introduced last school year. And this was an every other day, full year class for students, for seniors. Um, and it was the primary focus was preparing students for college and career. So working on that four year plan career plan that New York State requires, fi finalizing those pieces with that. Um, in addition to that, it's practicing interviews, applying for colleges, moving through the entire process, um, evaluating writing, time management skills. <coughs> and then we started, um, over the summer, we received a NYSED nice certification for work-based learning. And this was a renewal. So this had been applied for last year, and then the renewal allows us to continue on for five years. <coughs> what this certification does is allows us in-house to provide CTE, which is Career and Technical Education Cooperative Work Experience Programs, General Education Work Experience Programs, which is largely what the uh, Future <coughs> Focused Career Experience Program falls under, and then Career Exploration Internship as well. This right here is huge. To be able to do that in-house with our work-based learning coordinator, who's Kathy Whitaker, I'll be completely honest, in my experience, very few high schools have that component. So that's a huge win for us. And it expands graduation credentials and pathways for our students. So that is possible because, as I just said, Kathy Whitaker is not only a business teacher certification, or holds a business teacher certification, but she also is a work-based learning coordinator and holds that certification. So all of this together leads us to the future-focused career experience program development. How are we going to provide these experiences, more meaningful experiences for our students to get into the workforce, but not limited? So typically, in order to participate in such a um, work experience program, this would be reserved for BOCES students only through BOCES programs. This, the Future Focused Career Experience Program, opens it up to all of our students, all of our seniors, college track two. And we're able to do this through a partnership with DCMO BOCES Career Destinations. And that, that partnership expands our um, capabilities and region or regional access. 
to um, have our business partnerships. Additionally, the development was built off of our brilliant pathways, CFES, career development, stretching all the way down from, from seniors all the way down to the elementary grades and the mentor work that is done each year with that. And getting students thinking about, what do I want to be when I grow up? So the goals of our program are to provide access to career experiences for all senior, seniors. That's regardless of their diploma type, whether they're looking to graduate and go directly into the workforce or graduate and move on to college. We want to build future ready employment skills. So those essential skills, which sometimes are referred to as soft skills. Things like teamwork, <coughs> communication, time management, huge pieces that we have heard as feedback from local colleges of what students are needing coming into the college arena. There's a focus on resume writing and building. This is done throughout their high school career, but it's that attention to say, this is a continual process, and we're constantly needing to update this and take a critical look at our <coughs> Practicing interview skills and etiquette. So the interview skills last year were with um, members within the school. So they were volunteer staff that offered to serve on a interview panel. This year, the goal is to actually have business partners come in and help with the interview of students. It's also to provide career exploration. How many times have we heard a student say, I really want to do this, and then find out they go to college for it a couple years in, and suddenly their major has changed. We've all heard that story, right? This is to help students, if we can, avoid that step. Give them the opportunity to get out there and explore career opportunities in the fields that they're interested in and make a more informed decision of their college experience. It also allows us to contribute to the economic and workforce development in our region. By building these partnerships, we are building relationships with the community. And our students are going into the workforce, or going into the work workforce, shadowing, interning, sharing the experience, but also making the connections with the employers and seeing that, hey, this is a possibility. I never realized this was in our region. Or what could I bring to the region through this? Continuation of our components. So this is embedded in our senior seminar class. Again, this is a full year class every other day. It's weighted as a college course, and Mrs. Whitaker is currently working on obtaining college credit, the ability to award <coughs> college credit, so it'll be a dual enrollment class through TC3. Can I pause you real quick? Just an important point that resonates with me on that. It's an opportunity, if this is approved as college credit, for students who traditionally don't access dual enrolled courses because this is something that's available to all students regardless of academic <coughs> ability um, or need. So it's, it, it's pretty unique. There's a job shadowing or intern, internship placement requirement for that, and it's based on the student's interest <coughs> and future aspirations. It requires partnerships within the local community, as well as maybe within the region. And the biggest selling piece, I believe, for this is that it's very individualized. So it's based on student interests, future aspirations, but flexible enough to work within the student's schedules. So we know that some of our students are very, very busy, looking at you, <laughs> are very busy, and we're able to work around that whether it's scheduling through the day, into the evenings, or even on weekends. That's a possibility, too. Our students are also available to them, able to receive a career development and occupational standard credential, a CDOS credential, which you've maybe heard. The requirements of this, of, again, available to all of the students through this, is that they have a career plan. 
Students have been working on their career plan through my learning with their counselors since elementary school. They need to complete 54 work-based learning hours. Work-based learning hours are a little different than work experience hours. So work-based learning hours can encompass job shadowing, work experience hours, things like practicing interviews, resume writing, as well as internships. It can also encompass community service hours and projects and, and practices that they're already partaking in. They have to have an evidence of demonstrated achievements of the New York State CDOS standards. Simply put, it's a career plan, career development, career research. Those are the standards. And then they have to complete an employability profile. That employability profile will speak to the essential skills as well as possibly an overlay of industry-specific skills as well. So why work-based learning? It provides our students a very unique opportunity. They'll gain skills and credentials. It helps bridge a connection to the community and develop a partnership to grow within. Why internships? Typically, I don't like to read word for word what the slide says. Um, but some things that I'll point out here is to raise the level of workforce, workforce skills according to the particular needs of the company. So they're getting first-hand experience and knowledge of relatable information that each industry needs. Support economic growth and competitiveness, competitiveness and productivity. A stepping stone to college and satisfying and rewarding careers. Again, this is all about the exploratory experience for them. Who's enrolled? I touched on this a little bit. All of our seniors are enrolled. All of our seniors have this opportunity. We have the ability with strategic scheduling of the master schedule to be flexible. <clears throat> so students can leave to shadow or intern during this class period if they have availability within their schedule already through learning labs. It could be done on weekends or on a school break even. So a little bit more about the senior seminar class specifically. This is the class that Mrs. Whitaker is working hard to receive dual enrollment through TC3 with. And it combines college preparation and supervised unpaid employment in any occupational field with related classroom instruction. It's a beautiful way to bring together that college and career readiness for our students. Talks about college adjustment, learning how to study in college, which is transferable to how do we study in high school, setting goals, managing time, decision making, resume building, interview skills. When I looked at this slide um, as it was developed by Mrs. Whitaker, I keyed in on, hey, these are a lot of those essential skills that we're hearing from industry and from colleges that students need. So a typical work experience can involve three different experiences, or it could even involve all of them. The first one is a mentor at a workplace, and that mentor allows the person to shadow themselves or others for the job. That falls under a job shadowing experience. There's the way that it's connected to the classroom, such as writing a resume and a letter of application, how to interview for a job, how to interview for a college, interview, workplace rules and expectations, and business etiquette. This falls under work experience. And then there's an internship, which is more involved. You're looking at six to eight hours a week at a business, 
for three to six weeks. I keep hitting on this because it's really important. This program is built on student individualized student interests and aspirations <clears throat> with the flexibility to make it happen majority within their schedules. And it's aligned to their overall path to graduation and what they see themselves doing in the future. <clears throat> Sounds great for us. What's involved for the businesses? Is it a huge undertaking? So for the business, we expect that they have general conversations of what the expectations are for the students, what they can expect, the dress, behavior, that they provide supervised and safe working environments, that's always important, and that they are providing meaningful tasks. The meaningful task is more for an internship. Again, if they're shadowing, they're just observing and asking questions. That they sign the timesheets that are provided, and the, at the end of an internship, they will also evaluate the students based on the expectations that they outline. These are the businesses that Mrs. Whitaker has worked hard to already establish a partnership with. DCMO career destinations placements is very expansive. So when Mrs. Whitaker says, hey, I have a student that is interested in such and such, I can't find anything locally within Delhi. She can reach out to DCMO and they, they can say, well, let me look at our regional list and see if we can help with that. This list is continuing to grow. A lot of it is, there's a lot of legwork involved with this. So I was talking to Ms. Whitaker today, and she shared that some of the um, some of the difficulties with this is communication. She can call, she can email, but what she's found to be most effective is showing up and saying, "Here's what we're looking for. Would you be willing in helping us out?" And when she's able to do that, businesses are more than they're very eager to help out and receive us. So it's a circle of benefits. Students are benefits are benefiting because they're getting the experience. Businesses are benefiting because they're getting to have a voice in upcoming employment and in, in employers, in employees, sorry. The community, because we're trying to keep things locally and grow within our region, sharing the opportunity available to our students here. So you don't have to go elsewhere. You can stay here. And it all comes back to our vision, our mission, and our district goals. So our Future Focused Career Experience Program prepares students to excel in a diverse, dynamic society Provides a community of learners that will foster partnerships within our region and beyond, supporting a wide range of career pathways for our students, college, career, and will develop and maintain collaborative relationships with and between our district and the communities it serves. It's your turn. Any questions? <clears throat> I think you might have mentioned it, uh, but how are the students going to be transported to certain businesses for job shadowing? That's a great question. So as of right now, it's self-transport, but there's some flexibility in, in looking at opportunities. And my second thing is, I, I don't know if this is built into the program or not, but sometimes a student or even an adult uh, do not realize they have a skill set until they're put into a situation and they think, wow, I can sell this product and not even, and they might even be a, a student that never sold anything before. 
is there anything that pushes them to try something new? So it's based off of the career interest survey that is done with counselors and at the beginning of the school year. They will complete a career interest survey to give the baseline of opportunities for them to explore. Um, and there's always that conversation of, try it, you might like it. Right. All the seniors are in the snap right now? Correct. <clears throat> And this, so they're, they all have placements and they're working on those? Or? Good question. I have that in the notes because I didn't want to forget that. So there's 55 seniors total. About 20% have either already been placed or have pending placements. The goal, um, Mrs. Whitaker's goal is to have 100% of the students placed by November 1st. That's her deadline because she wants to cover um, some basic basis knowledge before students begin this, um, going over what the expectations are, how to conduct themselves, the reporting piece of all of that. There's a lot of housekeeping that needs to take place before. A lot of this continues to grow and expand based on networking. So if there are any local businesses, even in our community, or you know of anybody who might be interested in serving on that capacity, please put them in touch with either Mrs. Whitaker or Ms. Trask. Um, one example of that is Ms. Whitaker and I just went to the monthly Chamber of Commerce breakfast. And she struck up a conversation through networking with a gentleman from DCEC. And she said, I have a student who's interested in eco-friendly power production. And would you be interested in talking? And they said, not only that, we would love to have bring a student on board. Uh, and do an internship here. Uh, some of these internships can turn into paid summer jobs um, and beyond. It's, um, it, it's, we're really on the cusp of a, a pretty unique um, experience in the fact that it's open to any student, whether, I mean, students with IEPs, general education students, students who are on track for an advanced research diploma with distinction in math and science. And with the potential to provide college credit we're working on, um, and an extra seal of endorsement on any type of diploma that they walk out of here with. Um, it's, it, it's really, really exciting. Um, and the fact that this board has committed uh, to allowing us to have a teacher serve as a work-based learning coordinator based on that certification is really you know, commendable. So thank you for that. How many do you think will take place? I know you, think you said it can be on the weekend or in the evening. How was your experience so far? Is it some during the day or a lot? Or? There will be the majority during the day. Majority during the yes. school day. Yeah. They drive somewhere else, do this, and come back. Yeah. Or they finish out their day. Finish out their day. This avoids senior sitting study halls, you know, in a meaningful way that's giving them another elective credit for graduation. Um, to, to touch on the flexibility piece too, the, the part about the CDOS credential or the seal that requires the 54 work experience hours, we also recognize, um, I had this conversation with Lucy the other day, that there may be students who are in athletics, who are in um, you know, drama club, who, who their schedules are packed. That's not a requirement. In that case, that student may just do some sort of job shadowing. So 100% don't necessarily result in that additional credential, but it is available for students who want to achieve that, which is why we've added the evening and weekend component. Is it going to be during the class, this particular class time that students are allowed to leave? It's both. It's both. Well. So for some students, um, they can take the opportunity during the learning lab to partake in this. For some that are a little more busy and wish to do this, maybe not yet through the evenings or weekends, that is an opportunity for them to do that. What happens if they don't get their hours? So if they don't get their hours, they don't qualify for the CDOS credential. And that's not a requirement. That's just an optional credential for students. 
it does not count against them as a grade. They're not graded down if they don't get the hours. They still get the credit for graduation, um, but they just would not reach those 54 hours for the extra credential. And those hours, their dual enrollment college credit is not contingent on those hours. Either. That's right. Look forward to hearing an update in a few months. Carter, are you in senior seminar this, this semester? Yeah, I am. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think senior seminar could be a, a very useful tool um, because, especially with college applications, I during the summer I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how college applications worked because I was I feel like I'm left in the dark in that regard. Uh, trying to figure out what to do and where to go forward because taking that next step I feel like I need a lot of help with. I think senior seminar would be a much more helpful class if it was offered in the second semester of the junior year and the first semester of the senior year um, as I feel like getting you prepared in your second semester of your junior year for college applications to be done over the summer uh, I think that would be very helpful for students. Because like I said, I don't know if it's just because of COVID or what, but uh, many students, including myself, had no idea what the next step should be going from high school to college. Um, and for internships, I think that's also a great idea. It's just uh, finding time. Um, but yes, I think a senior seminar could be very helpful. Right now, right now as it stands, it's um, not really moving forward in any way. We haven't been doing a whole lot, um, but I think it's because we're just trying to get the ball rolling as, as it is a new, a new class and trying to figure things out. But like I said, as it goes forward, it could be very useful for college applications and just meeting with counselors because a lot of students, again, we don't have, uh, trying to reach a counselor is difficult. I'm trying to ask about college situations is hard. So I think if we had that time with the counselor as well, it would, it would be very helpful. Uh, but that's all I have to say. Awesome. No, that's great feedback. Um, and it's a perfect perfect transition to where I was going to go next, Carter. Thank you. Um, next steps. I love the idea about something in your junior year. I hadn't thought of that. Um, but that's certainly something we're cons uh, considering. Uh, because we are looking to expand this program beyond this pilot year. The long-term vision was always how do we now uh, step back into sophomore and junior years and what do those experiences look like? And are there opportunities to start at least shadowing um, on specific occasions <coughs> in sophomore and junior years? Because you can, once you're a freshman in high school, you can start building toward that 54 hours to work toward that CDOS credential. So it doesn't all have to be done in the senior year. Um, but as we take one step at a time and expand the program, that's another idea for consideration. So, um, yeah, those are all my points too. Thank you, Krista. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So as these gentlemen are coming up, as you know, um, last board meeting we started discussing the option of adding a school resource officer in the current school year. We have explored uh, three primary options at this point. Uh, I gave a brief presentation last time on sort of pros and cons or and minimally considerations for uh, contracting with a private security firm um, versus our local village police department. And so we have representatives from both organizations here tonight to give us short presentations on these options. Um, and then following the presentations later in the agenda, there'll be opportunity for um, a, a discussion, where the boards have discussion on this. But it does mean that you can't ask questions now as well. I, I will try to keep it short. Um, <laughs> I do have, I, I, I did have a presentation, but it's really long, so we'll try to keep it short. So my name is Rick Borchardt. I'm the owner of Upstate Security Consultants. 
Um, this is Dan Niemer. <clears throat> Dan Niemer's uh, one of our, he started uh, two months after me. I'm in my fifth year right now at Chicago Forks. Um, so I retired from the Boone County Sheriff's Office after 26 years uh, in 2018. Um, and I started in Chicago Forks that year. So uh, again, I'm going in my fifth year now at, at Chicago Forks as an SRO. Uh, I love it. It, it truly is uh, one of my favorite things to do for sure. Uh, Dan is the SRO at uh, Cambridge Guilford currently. And for you, four years? Four years there. I retired from the city of Binghamton Police after 20 years. Did another three years at the Village of Fort Dickinson Police while working at the school. Uh, right now, just doing straight SRO uh, at Cambridge Guilford. I'm the lone officer there. I cover all three buildings uh, throughout the day in, in each building. Uh, and again, I I go Rich says it's it's great, especially leaving the city of Binghamton and going out someplace like Bainbridge and what a what a difference. And it's just it's fun going to work every day. So currently we have uh, we're in seven different school districts right now. We have uh, twelve SROs in those seven schools. Uh, we're in four different counties right now: uh, Broome County, Alcino, um, uh, Chenango, and, and so we 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 are spread out. We have. Uh, officers from state police retired uh, from from Binghamton PD. Obviously, uh, we're we're pretty spread out as far as the different uh, departments that we've all retired from. We're all at 20 plus years of of, uh, of law enforcement experience that we've all retired from, and and we bring a lot of experience to the schools that we are currently in. So, in some of your books that we just handed out. So a couple of couple handouts in there. One of them has the schools that we are currently in, um, and then there's another handout in there that just gives us a, a, a brief description of some of the things that we do in, in schools. So we kind of do things a little differently. We're, we we like to be kind of in, integrated into your school. We we would dress we dress down. We, we exactly what Dan's wearing right now. <clears throat> that's how we would dress in the school. On the back though, we would have an SRO. It's in, in big letters so that. Everybody would know who the SRO is. We do carry. We carry concealed on campus, so kind of a soft uniform. We feel like that's just kind of a better way, as a better approach, and, and it's better for I think our students to come to, and approach us, talk to us, right? And so that's kind of how we do that. Uh, provide a safe learning environment for students and staff. Uh, interaction with students and staff uh, to develop trusting relationships. That's that's a really big thing for us. I mean, maybe Dan can talk a little bit about that. But. So throughout the day, you know, in every school is different. I mean, if we were to get the contract out here, you're going to work with that SRO to make it what you need for that SRO, what works for you. For Bay Bridge, you know, we're out there in the mornings for arrivals, we're out there at the end of the day for dismissals, I'm in the hallways talking to the kids. I may go in the classroom and talk about the Bill of Rights for one of the classes. Um, I try to, well, came early tonight so we could see the BG girls playing out back here so that the kids know that I'm involved. It's not just during the day. Uh, you know, we read to the kids. We've had officers get into plays and be part of a play for the school. Uh, so it's really building that relationship, not just with the kids, but with the staff, too. I have a lot of staff that approach me. We all have issues in our life. They just need some advice. And, you know, that, that experience I had in 23 years of active law enforcement give them that little bit of help, maybe who they can talk to, turn to, and that filters right down to the kids. Um, we go on home visits. If we have students that may not show up as much as we'd like them there, we go with a staff member, administrator, counselor, and we're there as that sort of that safety net to make sure no one goes alone. The world has changed. Uh, so knocking on a door, you never know what's going to be on the other side. So we tend to do the knock, introduce ourselves, introduce the staff member we're with, and then let them take over and explain why they're really there, what's going on with Johnny or Susie, how can we get them back into school, you know, what can we do to help. Um, my door's always open as well as Rick's, you know, for the kids just to stop in, in case they just want to vent for a little bit. They know they can say anything they want in my office, they don't get in trouble for using words that they shouldn't use in the hallways. Um, I handle visitor management, uh, the Raptor system that we have in place. I do door access, all the badges for all our staff. Uh, I handle the video and the, the cameras throughout the district. Um, so again, not every officer in every school does that. It's just depending on what works for that district and that officer. So we do a lot. We can never list it in this for what we're involved with. So that's just a snapshot of sort of what we do. 
Um, in presentations like this, we want we don't want people looking at the screen behind us. We want that personal approach, and we'd like to put something out there real general, and then have everybody ask questions and sort of get the information that way. I mean, yeah, another part of that too is we, we we're a part of safety committees, uh, and, and so you know whether it's a district safety committee, building safety committees. I know myself at, at Chenango Forks. Uh, I'm on all of those committees, so I have a little bit of an input on, on what, what happens, but um, and, and some guidance that I try to give the schools, and, and so I think it works really well for us to be able to be a part of some of the committees that, that we're on. So, I mean, again, we can keep talking and, and go on and on, but we would love to hear some questions or concerns or anything that you have. I have one. Um, you mentioned Bainbridge. You've got three buildings that yes. you... Role, I guess, yes. a word. How do you find? Is that so the way the school had it set up was like seven, 70, 20, 10 percent. So the majority of my time is spent at the high school, and then you know Greenlawn Elementary is only a couple minutes away. Spent a couple hours there, and then I drive out to Guilford, go see my little ones out there, uh, go to recess, push them on swings. You know, spend my time out there, and then turn around, go right back down to the town of Bainbridge, uh, and I do that every day. I don't. Some days I make that determination on my way up 88. I live in Binghamton still. Uh, so driving up 88, I was like, you know, I'm going to start at Greenlawn Arrivals. And I'll, you know, throw a text out to the admin. I don't know where I'm going to start today so that everybody knows. Um, the nice thing is we just purchased uh, a good amount of radios and a new communication system for the district. So they can reach me wherever I'm at pretty much through that, through the bus channel on my radio. I also have other station or other channels. Uh, that are, are close to most people, but the, the admin has. So yeah, I change it around, nothing's routine, just like I wouldn't patrol on the streets in the city of Binghamton, I wouldn't do anything routine, and we don't do, I don't do that there at the district. So I keep them guessing, so. Rick, I know the board is interested in uh, details surrounding contracting costs. Yeah. So um, usually we, we would always ask for a three-year contract because that's what we would expect our SROs to work for the company. We, we ask for a three-year commitment because for a couple of reasons. I mean, we, we are all nationally trained. So any SRO that works for the company is nationally trained through NASRO. So we send them to school, costs a lot of money. And so if we invest in, in SRO, we want them to also kind of invest in, in us in the district so that they're in. And more importantly, we want them to, to be there long enough to build relationships with those students and, and with the staff. So uh, usually we would do a three-year contract and, and it's, it's what, the way we do it is it's 65000 for the year, uh, but that's, that's the only cost that you have. The, the school pays the company, and then I take care of the SROs. There's no extra cost. There's no, there's no, uh, no need for health benefits, any of that stuff. We're all retired. We all get, get health benefits. We all get our pensions. Um, and so that's kind of how we do that. The other thing is, and if, I, if you don't mind if I add, we always try to find an SRO that's close to the district that we're, we're at. Right, so we don't like somebody to have to travel too far, right? And, and so, and, and the person that we would hire for your district would be your full-time SRO. So they're here, and your staff is here, your SRO is here. If we had um, a couple of local candidates uh, and we had a preference, would you say, no, I'm picking this person I would always. This is actually. I would actually. I would absolutely work with the district for sure. I would. We want you to be happy with the person as long as that person is qualified and is is the person that we want to, to have and is through the company. We certainly would work with the district. When I got hired by BG, I went in front of a panel, like 15, 20 people panel, including students. You know, any kind of stakeholder in the community. Uh, and I think I was one of three or four that was interviewed. Um, that's how they wanted to do it. Not every school is like that now. They're, they're okay with who we, we have. Um, we introduce them, we have me, we get resumes from them, we do our background on them a little bit, find out, you know, they may not come from the same department I did, but we can reach out. We all know somebody in that department, we can reach out and talk to them. But if we have people, we want your involvement, absolutely. And I didn't catch it. Do you wear what you were wearing now when you're? Yes, yeah, so this would just be untucked. I'd have my sidearm on, uh, you know. This is, or, you know, like I said, I don't have the SRO in the back today. Uh, don't usually wear it for presentations or when I'm going to be out in a place I don't know, restaurants, stuff here. I'm going to grab a white tea. 
Uh, but most, all my shirts say SRO on it. I did come from Binghamton out there. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know any law enforcement. Uh, didn't want that friendly fire, so I wanted that SRO on the back. Um, now I know everybody out there. I know all the state police, sheriffs, uh, Bainbridge police. We all work very closely together, um, which is nice, too. You know, yeah. Knowing people and being out there as long as I am. Uh, but yeah, we we these um, you know we'll pay our money on Fridays for casual Fridays at the school for whatever cause they're going to wear jeans you know so we fit in a little bit. Yeah. Um, we some districts want the same color as as whatever color the district is. Some don't. They want you sort of looking different so they can pick you out. Um, I had heard that if there was an active shooter, it's best that you blend in rather than show that you're an outside agency? Well, if there's an active shooter, they're going to know full well why I'm there, because they're going to see what I'm doing, too. And if all the drills that we practice every year, there's not going to be too many other people. Like I said, getting to know your local law enforcement is extremely important, working with them, having them come help out when we do our drills, having them be a part of everything, uh, make sure they know the way around all their buildings, uh, come and use our bathrooms, write reports in our parking lot, whatever. I invite people, all these guys all the time. And it's great to have that relationship. I, I invited our local uh, sheriff's department, state police. They, they had a joint uh, big SWAT uh, uh, training. It was a whole day. They used most of our high school and middle school this summer. Loved that they were there. They get to know our buildings, and, and I think that's an important thing to do. Any other questions, concerns? These guys are going to stick around. Yeah, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> we have a presentation next from Delphi PD. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me pull that up for you. We're blessed to have options. <laughs> and so uh, even after this next presentation, we can ask questions of, of either agency, certainly, and stuff. Okay, so for those of you that remember, my name's Justin Moore. I don't think you were here at last board meeting, right? Okay, so I'm Justin Moore. I'm with Delhi Police Department. Um, I've been here a couple of years, and I started at the Sheriff's Office, so I've been in Delaware County my whole life. I know some of you guys. Uh, some of you guys know me. So we'll get right into it. So what is school resource officer basically? Is as sworn law enforcement officers, we have arrest powers. And by that, I don't mean that we're going to just arrest students. <coughs> so by arrest powers, I mean that if they're having a medical emergency, like someone's under the influence, we can take them basically against the will of the hospital if they don't want to go because they need help. Or if they're having a mental health emergency, we can take them to get help, whether they want to or not. A lot of times they don't want to go, but they still need that help. So we can actually take them to get that help, whether they want to or not. Um, Delhi uh, consists of full and part-time officers. So all of our officers go through the same mandatory trainings. All of our officers are instructors. So we would work with teachers. We have no problem doing that. Uh, we also have the authority to restrain, meaning if there's somebody kind of losing it here, going off the walls, whether it's a little kid or a senior, whatever it may be, we can physically restrain them until we can safely get them help. Um, the liability for anything like that would be covered by the PD or, and our union. So nothing would fall back under the school. It's covered by our union and the police department. Uh, roles and responsibilities, I know we just went through this, but we're, so we're trying to work with, loop, with youth. Uh, the school resource officer goes through a state mandated program, the SRO program, and they focus on violence prevention, cyber safety, because everything involves computers these days, so that's important. Trauma and trauma informed care, whether it's physical, mental, or social. Uh, we're also first aid, CPR, AED trained. We do a lot of mentoring. We actually have, I know she just talked about internships. Um, we do our own internships through the college right now, so every year we have four students, I believe, two in the spring, two in the fall, that we do internships with. And we have no problem counseling students. I still talk to the high school students outside of school. They always call me, they text me, no issues with that. They'll stop by if they see us on the street. Um, again, teaching demonstrations or assist teaching, whatever it may be. And the biggest thing is what they talk about is a presence. Being 
having an SRO as a presence is a huge deterrence from anybody who may have bad intentions or even if they just want to break a window, knowing that there's a presence somewhere in the school is a huge deterrence from all of that. So again, differences between law enforcement and private security, they answered a lot of the questions that I'll touch on, which is very nice. Um, so we have mandatory training and it's through the state, so we're required to go through training that they've done for 20 years plus years. But ours is continuing, it's ongoing. We, up, we update our training, whether, well, we all know, things change. In the 90s, computers weren't really a thing. Now computers are kind of everything. So as our life progresses, so does our training. Everything's always changing. So we're trained, well, they will be trained in the SRO training program. We're all trained for Narcan, so if there's ever an incident where someone's having a medical emergency or a drug overdose, uh, we're all familiar with and trained in drug, alcohol, mental health, domestic violence, and child abuse, science for child abuse, things like that. We work closely with other agencies, not just other law enforcement agencies, other like Teller Opportunities, Child Advocacy Center, things like that. And we're training diversity, <coughs> equity, and inclusion. So we also have access to additional resources. They touched on it. The biggest thing about having a SRO that's local is we have access to all those resources. So working here in Delhi, we know everybody that works for the fire department, everybody that works for EMS, that works for child advocacy, social services, sheriff's office. We're all familiar with each other, we all work with each other. And things right here in Delhi is, well, that's the top three that's in here, the DRA, the canine forensic interviewer. I'm actually certified for all those, ironically, they're number one on there. Um, forensic interviewer is interviewing children who have been abused or may have been abused. So we work with Child, Ad child Advocacy Center, separate them from their parents a little bit and try to find out what happened if there's a case of abuse. Um, emergency services, again, is we have immediate communications to 911, whereas if someone has to make a phone call to 911, the average time from making that phone call to dispatching law enforcement or EMS or whatever it may be, it takes about five seconds to put something over the radio, and then they start the process. So it's a lot faster. Um, so again, there's no time wasted to make phone calls. Oh, sorry. Is the process faster when the SRO makes the phone call? Because I know that um, sometimes when you call 911 in Delhi, if someone's having a heart attack, they show up 45 minutes later. Yep. So, but if you call, it's faster? If we're on the radio, huh? it's 10 times faster. Okay. If, we're on, if the SRO picks up his phone and makes a phone call, it's still going to take a couple minutes because they're developing the CAD, they're asking questions, whereas on the radio, shoot it over the radio, they dispatch the next agency, whether it's fire department, EMS, whatever it may be, and things just get rolling. They just update them as they're in route, basically. Um, we went over the liability and able to transport for mental health or under the influence issues. Um, we also, if let's say somebody broke a window, and we have safely secure or store evidence or somebody stole a computer or whatever may have happened. We would do that ourselves. Doesn't We don't have to call another agency to do it. So there's no chain of custody issues. Um, we can also conduct our own follow-up investigations. So theoretically, if there was a student who called in an anonymous bomb threat, found out who that student was, we can be the ones to go to their house and do the follow-up investigations, find out what's going on, if it was legit, if there's issues at home, whatever the case may be, rather than asking somebody else to do it, which is then they ask somebody else to do it, and it's like a telephone game where you lose communication or you lose facts. Um, so these were some questions that they all they answered already. So for private security, the question, some of the questions we had were who mandates the training, which they answered, um, and proof of training. Are they able to detain, hold, or control someone? Who covers the liability if someone gets hurt, whether it's the security guard or officer or teacher or staff member or student? Uh, what resources do they have? Do they have access and readiness to local resources like law, fire, EMS? They touched on it. They get to know the other agencies, so that's great. Um, knowledge of the area, which they also touched on. They like hiring local, which is also great. Um, scheduling flexibility, so for sporting events, after school events, like even this. So Lauren, mm -hmm. when I walked in tonight, she's like, 
why are you here? Perfect question. I would ask that. So an SRO would basically be able to be the one to ask that. Why is somebody here? What are they doing in the building at this time of night? That's weird. You probably thought I was weird. Some weird guy walking in, right? Yeah, I forgot that you were. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Now I won't. Good job, Laura. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then coverage. So if they go on vacation or if they need time off or sick time, who fills in? For us, we're on 24 hours. There's always somebody here. Uh, additional benefits to school is the officers here in the village have large baseline knowledge of the area, school, students, families, emergency services we were touched on. Uh, we have prior report with students, staff, parents, board members. So he, Jim's known me since I was a kid. I don't know if you realized. <laughs> Do you realize that? What's that? Did you realize that you knew me since I was a kid? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know if you realized that. So others. Staff members and teachers like uh, Mrs. Whitaker, she had me in high school. We actually did a, something very similar to your internship project we had in Handys. Um, I have family members here in uh, Delhi, a couple of them. I have family members that are students, teachers. I get texts to my phone from some of the students here, just friends of family, just that like keep me aware of the things that go on at school. So we already have a lot of rapport built. I live locally, other officers all live locally. I think our furthest one away is 30 minutes. I'm seven minutes away. Um, so the building right with students allows trust to be built and at and outside of school, so they touch that too. <coughs> working with your students, working with your students, interacting with students is a big part of their life. So an SRO does do that. The Sheriff's Office has an SRO, he's constantly interacting with students. And then benefits of the school is the immediate response. The officers are already on scene if something happens. Uh, quick access to additional resources, which we just touched on. Presence of an officer is large, crime, criminal activity, deterrence. So we were touching on that too. Window breaks, they're not going to walk <coughs> up that walking through the window if there's an officer running <coughs> around the school because they don't want to get caught. Uh, staff training. So you know, since we're all instructors, Personally, I've been here to teach teachers. I've been to social services. I've been to other opportunities. I've been to tons of different agencies teaching and informing. Just keeping people up to date with current trends. Um, student awareness and education, so we can again teach students whether it's driving, alcohol, drugs, even if it's sports events. I've coached in Andes for younger students. Um, the liability falls on us rather than the school. And again, report staff, students, parents. So she, she wanted to touch on estimated costs. We have a current contract with the county for an officer to be present at social services, and that's around 85000 for 12 months. So going based off that, roughly 10 months would be around six to 7000 very similar. Um, so all these numbers are hypothetical. We're just basing it off of what our current contract is and it's subject to change because like they have a three-year contract, our union contract is every three years, it's adjusted. So if our pay increases, this 65, 70,000 may also increase depending on what happens with our contract. And then, so this will cover the officer salary and partial benefits. If they're a full-time officer, if they're a part-time officer, they don't necessarily have benefits. If they're we have a lot of retired officers that work in Delphi too, but they're still employed through us, so they're collecting their retirement from wherever, state police or NYPD, or there's a couple others that I can't think of off the top of my head, but they don't need their um, benefits, so they just work part-time. They also mentioned before that they're in plain clothes. Our detail at social services, our officers are in plain clothes. If they come out to a call to assist us, there's times where we have something that needs more than one officer or two officers on the scene. They come out to assist. They have all their equipment with them, so they have a jacket that says police or a vest that says police on it they can throw on. They can carry concealed, they can carry like an open carry. Um, they can come here in a marked patrol car or an unmarked patrol car, we have both in the village. So there's tons of options, and we're always willing to work with schools, different agencies, social services, whatever it may be. And do you have any questions? These are some of the 
other programs that we work with, so the Child Advocacy Center, Stop the OPI, DARE, things like that. I have one question. Um, <laughs> if you had an officer in our school and there was an emergency outside of the school, somewhere in the village or town or whatever, in your jurisdiction, uh, would you pull that officer? They can, depending on the severity. So in social services this year, if I'm thinking correctly, maybe twice they've been pulled out. One was for the shooter threat on the square. Second time was an officer calling for assistance, basically he was fighting with someone, if I'm thinking correctly. It would have to be more severe circumstances for an officer to be pulled out of their detail. Because we have a sheriff's office right here. We have multiple officers on in Delhi all the time. State police usually isn't too far. We're centered in the county, so all the barracks are reasonable distance away from us to help us if we need it. But there is times where they've been pulled out of their detail. Thank you. Justin, when I was talking with Brian about the 10 to 12 month piece, um, he alluded to the fact that this would only work uh, the 10 month side of it if the village agreed to pick up the two month summer piece of it to offset that cost. Yes. Is, is that true? So that, if it's a full-time officer, the village would have to pick up the two months and they'd be patrolling the village during the summer. Okay. If it's a part-time officer that covers up, they wouldn't necessarily have to pick up the cost because if it's a part-time officer that doesn't want to work during the summer or if they want to work different hours, cover different shifts, there's no need to have an extra officer on when we already have enough on. So would there be a situation potentially where we would have two different people potentially? Like is it a matter of trying to cover shifts to, to get us the time um, off? There's, there's always that chance. Just like if that officer was on, if the SRO decided they needed a sick day or vacation day, someone else would fill in. There's always that chance that can happen that way. Um, the way social services contract works is anybody can fill it, but typically there's one or two, mostly mainly one, then the second officer works Fridays because the first one can't. Okay. Basically, that's how we do it down there is someone works a couple days, someone fills in as needed. There's two officers, main officers that work there. Everybody else will have different details or different areas of coverage. So our board is going to grapple with a kind of a tough decision tonight, or attempt to arrive at a tough decision. So in order for our board to have answers to the most questions possible, would you mind just going back? You had a slide that had some questions that you weren't sure that a private agency could achieve or not. I just, in fairness to everybody, I want to just give these guys an opportunity again to respond to those questions if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. So some of them touched on. That's put you on the spot again, right? No, 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 no. Want to make sure the board has all the information well, they, that they need. So as far as the training goes, like, so we, we're nationally certified school resource officers. Uh, the company takes care of sending us to that, and then the company also takes care of our recall as far as our firearms twice a year. We're only mandated to do it once, but we do it twice. Uh, any other trainings that we can send officers to? I mean, my district sent me to a threat assessment training down in Virginia for three days. So any kind of trainings we work with the district, they want me to go, they'll help out. <coughs> if there's something that we can send an officer to, we'll work on that. Uh, I'm always watching webinars and, and any kind of trainings, um, reading up on the Uvalde incident and, you know, what happened there and what went wrong from the beginning to end and trying to gather that information. So the training sometimes is self-motivated. Um, but we stay current on our, our laws uh, because the laws do change. Um, the, the liability part of it, the, the, the company carries a $2 million policy, a liability policy. Okay, so that's $2 million per SRO. And that's in the contract as well. As far as resources, we, we have the same resources. I mean, we're, I work in a volunteer district. You can call 911. You're not getting anybody for a while. That's just what it is. Uh, Baybridge Police, they're not a full-time police department. So you could call 911, there's not, there may not be anybody there. It then goes to the state police. Everyone's going through a manpower shortage right now as far as law enforcement goes, and their numbers are, are low. 
And they're telling us that. They're supposed to, the governor wanted them in our building every day, state police. It's not happening. We haven't seen anybody. They just don't have the manpower right now. There's a big turnover, a lot of retirements, a lot of people choosing not to get into law enforcement, um, which is unfortunate because it's a great career. Um, but I work daily with, I mean, we have uh, Shango County Mental Health right in our buildings. So I work with her. Uh, the nice thing about that is if we do have investigations going on with Child Protective Services or the outside law enforcement agency, they work with us, they handle it, we stay in school. Yeah. We're not leaving to go investigate and spend our time elsewhere. Do we go on home visits? Yes. But as far as long-term investigations, outside law enforcement handles that and we stay in our buildings and that's the way we think it should go. Uh, like sporting events, after school events, we do definitely do those things. Proms, uh, uh, athletic events, uh, we, we definitely do all of those things. Graduation. If, graduation, if, if they want us to be there, uh, I'm actually doing twice this week, I'm doing uh, open houses in our elementary school. Are, are those added in addition to the $65,000? Yeah, so they basically what that would be though is what, what we could do comp time, which would just be, you know, if, if we work two hours or whatever, you would have two hours of comp time. Or we could, we could figure out another way to do that from a financial standpoint for having, if you're going to have an SRO come back to the school late at night or for, for an extra event, then yeah, we would definitely require some type of a payment, but again, we, we could work that out. Okay. So to expand on that question, and this is Justin for you too. Um, again, one of the models that was suggested to me was that, that kind of that, there, it's prorated down to uh, assuming a 40 hour work week. So we know that we've got Columbus Day weekend coming up, right? We're only going to need somebody here four days. <clears throat> so that fifth the day that's off could be floating hours for evening kind of stuff. Is it that degree of flexibility? You're talking about that. Brian had described that to me previously, but. You guys want a microphone? No, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so our schedule is very flexible. Personally, my schedule, I can. Flex it however I need to. I can work two hours one day, 18 hours the next day, whatever is needed, as long as there's coverage in the village. But I mean, I'm not here for an SRO position out of the village. But all our officers are, have been, their schedules have flexed one way or the other, whether you need to do a four hour this day, 12 hours that day, just so coverage works. So it's really as needed. We all, most of us, not going to say all, I don't know if people like it, but. We, most of us don't mind flexing our hours to make things fit. And I think you, Dan, said earlier is each school is a little different, and so for us, we would definitely look into something like that. If, if that's what if that's what works for the district, you know, and if that was a better thing to do, then we would definitely do that. And then sick and vacation time. I know Justin mentioned this. Um, so yeah, yeah. So for for our guys, and you know what we tell yes, this is a retirement job. Your retirement job part is after that hundred approximately 85 days a year you work. You have holidays, weekends, snow days, all summer off. So we don't expect you to be taking vacation time. We tell them right from the get-go. We don't expect you to take vacation time. If you're sick, if you have a sick kid, family first. Okay, we make that very clear. But we don't expect people taking vacation times during the school year. You have all that other time to use it. Um, and it's a good quality of life to have that summer off to spend time with your kids. And you don't need to be taking time off. Now, so, again, something happens. We all went through COVID. You know, I, I got stung, so I had to be out and uh, for five days. It just it happens. Um, people get sick, but as a company, we're working on that part of it too to look at different options we have. Uh, we really like to have one SRO in a building, in a district, to build those relationships and not keep moving people around. We don't make a practice of that. We, we want to find somebody that's within that area the best we can. I mean, I drive a half hour, 45 minutes to Guilford, but I also spend a lot of time with some of these teachers now. Uh, we golf together, I go to their houses, you know, I'm building that relationship with them. Um, so we want, you know, an officer to stay in a district and build those relationships and not be moving around district to district, not be moving out, you know, that's why we ask for that three-year commitment. Um, and that knowledge of the area, the students, the families, like I said, I, I'm, one phone call away to the you know state police investigators or the uniform patrol or Shango County under sheriff. Um, do you um, do you have school districts that have summer school? 
I, I worked summer school this year for the uh, Bainbridge. They asked me to do it, and so I did. And that was outside of, you know, we, we had to do an amendment to the contract. Uh, there was never a plan in place for us to cover summer school. And then, unfortunately, after Ubaldi, there was a lot of anxiety, and they just felt uh, they wanted me there if I could do it. So I did it for the month. Again, they did summer school in all three buildings, so I was bouncing around, you know, all day long. What's what's our would be a recommendation for based on this summer? Uh, we'll be looking to run some degree programs here again this and summer. We have yeah, yeah, it's weeks. usually about five weeks in the summer okay. um, on a short schedule. And would that be something we would want coverage under this plan for? Potentially, we haven't really discussed that, but potentially. I think I'm the first out of all our schools yeah. that yeah. that ever. They never asked, but yeah, they no know. one's no one's asked. Yeah. And Baker's asked, and I was able to do it and willing to do it. So I get again, every district is different. So we try to mold it what works best, you know, for the district. The best we can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Carter, do you have any questions from a student perspective? I'm sorry, Sean, I didn't see you. Okay. Uh, no, um, no, I mean from a student uh, perspective, it seems like this could be a very it sounds like a very good idea. Uh, I think having that law enforcement presence, as well as just being a friendly face, is very important to all the students. Uh, you said that you build relationships with the students as well, like in, as well as the teachers. Oh, absolutely! I have all sorts of dad jokes, and they work better with the little ones. I mean, you get a kid in crisis, you know, anywhere third, fourth, fifth grade. If you could work the work the word fart into a conversation, you got it. You know, at that age. Um, so yeah, I'm pre-K through, you know, seniors. So I have to change my approach throughout the day. Um, you know, again, coming from the city of Binghamton out to Bainbridge, you know, I had to chip away from some of that stuff. But, you know, those protections that I built up in 20 years in the city of Binghamton, you know, and I told the kids, I said, listen, you can call me whatever you want. Call me Dan, Officer Dan, Officer Geemer, Mr. Geemer. You know, you really can't scratch the surface of what I was called in 20 years in the city of Binghamton. <laughs> Not that it was a challenge. And I have kids that, that do call me Dan and they're comfortable. Some call me Mr. Geemer, you know, and, and as long as they're respectful. You know, I think it's important for them to have that, you know, they see me as a human being. So, students, are students able to, if they want to have a conversation with you, are they able to contact you in mm -hmm. some form? Okay. Yep, they can email me, they can call me, I do have a work phone, uh, they can come to my office anytime during the day, the counselors know they can call me, if I'm not in that building, I'll come right back. Um, like I said, if it's between classes or, and I've built some, you know, you tend to build those relationships with the kids that are a little bit more spirited because those are the ones you spend the, the time with. Uh, so if you, if the staff know that you have that relationship, that you can reel them back in, you know, easier than they can, they'd rather call and get the kid back refocused and get them back to learning. And if I can help and make that very short period of time, they love it, so. Sean, did you have a question? Yeah, and this goes for anyone. Thanks for coming out, great presentations. Um, you both mentioned it deterrence. Uh, you know that presence, and I, and I fully believe it. I'm just wondering if there's any metrics that you come across or, or seen you know, improved attendance or reduced reduction in incidences or you know any, any kind of metrics data. Showing interest in kids, I think showing interest in students sometimes. To me, I think like if if, if you think that there's somebody might be a student that might be uh, susceptible to. Know, crisis or something or some kind of mental health or I, I think sometimes just showing them a little bit of saying hi to them as, as they walk down the hallway or you know just looking at them some some kids don't really get that so we, we try to you know talk to all the kids I go to the cafeteria I go to the, the table with one or two kids sitting while the other tables are full of kids I go hang out with the kids that are one or two kids sometimes just a little bit of you know interaction and I don't think there's any hard data out there. No, there's no, no kind of tracking. However, I can I can tell you that there are students that I've gone to their house on home visits and was successful in getting them back in the school that very day within 15 minutes. And I think that shows that they can talk to me, that I'm realistic, I understand the issues, their problems, that they may be having, uh, and then I check in with them later that day. And then the next morning I'll check in with them. If they're not there, right back to the house. You know, and I'll go to the house every day if that's what it takes to get them back in school and get them in their seat where they need to be. Because their job is to come to school more. So if they don't like it, school is never my thing. Um, so I, I think I do have that connection where it was difficult for me. 
uh, to sit all day. Um, my parents will tell you. <laughs> but. Piggybacking on what Sean said, uh, I do think our decisions as a board are da data based. So it would be very helpful if you had said, well, these are the six schools we are in, and we've been there for three years, and we see uh, increased graduation rate, or uh, less referrals to mental health, or um, less absenteeism. You know, we, um, I would encourage your organization to try to keep a data so that we can make Yeah, that. good, that's very good, actually. Yeah, we'd have to definitely work with the districts on some of that, and I know COVID, Screwed up everything for those years. Yeah, so there's no doubt after yeah. that. Uh, we haven't still seen the peak of what we're going to see from COVID yet. We're still going to see a lot more mental health issues coming up. A lot of kids that lack social skills because they were out for so long. Um, but that would be great to yeah. you know, work with the district and try to come up with some of those numbers. Um, I think the only data the we can give you, some, yeah. some sort. The hard data I can give you is again, I've been there for four years. They want me back for another three. We have uh, Shangle County, uh, we have Green. Green only had an officer for six months. Now they want a second officer. We have one starting next Monday. Um, Unitigo wants a second officer. So I think there's that's the data we can go on, yeah. is that they want us back and they want more of us in the product that we present. And again, we're not knocking anything that, that active law enforcement does. We have to work with them every single day. And we love that relationship. So we're not gonna say anything negative about anything they do or don't do um, because we live that life ourselves. And we depend on them, and we hope that they would depend on us here too. So, any other questions? Justin, anything else on your side? Um, I don't think so. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Both. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, we we'll move into public comments. Board of Education believes that open Thank communication you. with our parents, students, teachers, personnel, and district residents is very important. For this reason, the board sets aside time at the beginning and end of each regular meeting for public comments. However, in order to focus on tonight's previously scheduled agenda, as a general rule, the board will not be able to respond to your comments and questions at this time. We may refer your comments and questions to the administration for follow-up, or we may add the subject of your comments to the agenda of a future meeting. Either way, please be assured that we welcome and take your comments very seriously. The board asks each person to limit comments to not more than two minutes in order for the district clerk to maintain accurate records of the meeting. Each individual is requested to state his or her name and address. Have any public comments? Matters. Uh, motion, please, to approve the minutes of the annual organizational meeting that was held on July 13th, 2022. So moved. Lucy, and a second? Second. Well, thank you. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion is approved. Uh, motion, please, to approve the minutes of the regular meeting held on July 13th, 2022. So, Dylan, thank you. And a second? That's a good thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays? The motion is carried. Personnel recommendations. Um, I will take a motion, please, to go from Resignations through Madison Miller. Thank you, please. So moved. Second. second. Thank you. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Uh, any nays? Okay. The motion is carried. Uh, motion, please, to approve. Um, okay, as a temporary non certified substitute teacher. Sting. Okay. And a second? Second. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments? All in favor? All in favor. Any nays? 
motion is carried. Motion, please, to approve Sandra Noonan through Thomas Tom Glidden. Second, second. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the motion is carried. Motion, please, to approve Dave Kelly and Warren Kelly. Abstain. So, or second. Second. So, thank you. Any? Questions or comments? Not on that one. But if we, there might be a typo for the, for Julie Ferrara on that, and the, the dates, it's different than all the rest. I just noticed that. So should that be 6.30, 2023, or is there a reason that it's I March think this question that just says aid. No, 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 the dates. The date. Oh, the dates. Uh, from 9 6 2022 is All the rest days, 6 30. 30. 6 2023. She's probationary, so it'd be six months. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, because she was appointed as a yeah, bullshit. This is not a substitute right. position. Yeah, it's not a substitute date. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, so that is correct. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion is carried. Uh, motion, please, to approve Terry Lennick. So moved. Yes, I guess working. So thank you. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Okay. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Motion is carried. Motion, please, to approve Bill Mokay. So moved. Thank you. In a second. Thank you. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, thank you. The motion is carried. Okay, and finally, a motion, please, for Glenn Mielis through Linda Raver. So. Okay, second. Second. Four, thank you. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. And the motion is carried. No financial reports. A recommendation or a motion, sorry, to accept the special education report from the Director of Special Education for August 30th, 2022. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the motion is carried. We will have Ms. Trask again to give us their school report. Schools start with student enrollments. In the elementary building, there's 333 students. The middle school has a total enrollment of 191 students. In sixth grade, there were four new enrollments, two exits. Seventh grade, two new enrollments. Eighth grade, one exit. At the high school, there's a total of 214 students. And the ninth grade, we received two new enrollments. Tenth grade, a new enrollment. 11th grade, a new enrollment and three exits. And 12th grade, we received one new enrollment. For student successes in the elementary, Mrs. Mabel shares, it's wonder wonderful to see all the smiling faces each and every morning heading up the hill into the building. And as well as middle school, Miss Little shares, it is great to see the pods filled with students and see learning that is taking place. Students have been actively engaged in many hands-on learning experiences. I'm a bit more long-winded. So for the high school, we want to take a minute to recognize Julia Baxter. She received the National Rural and Small Town Award 
through the College Board for a National Recognition Program. Oh. Yes. It's an award that's given to students that take the PSAT, are from a rural or small town, hold a GPA of 3.5 or higher at the time of testing, and score within the top 10% on the PSAT within the state, or score three or higher on two or more distinct AP exams within the eligible period. So it's huge. Mm -hmm. um, we began meetings with the student senates to discuss the dress code and they were organized and actually they began today and it was invigorating and exciting. So I look forward to having an update for you in October on that. Tyler Brannigan is serving as the student representative in the Catskill Area School Study Council, otherwise known as CASIC, in their student leadership program. It's meetings throughout the school year that he'll be attending for that. Tyler Brannigan and Ali Ferrara were selected as the section for Student Athlete Advisory Committee, and they're going to serve as a voice for the section for um, student athletes. Our FFA members traveled to SUNY Cobleskill last Friday, and they observed and participated in the Cobleskill High School Days, which is looking at the facilities and programs available at SUNY Cobleskill, but also opportunities to participate in hands-on learning too, and competitions. Our German club is exchanging with students um, we have right now we're hosting 18 students from germany i would say the name of the town but i won't do it justice so carter Lube. 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 There it is. thank you um, and they'll be with us through wednesday for faculty and staff <clears throat> updates miss maple says she'd like to acknowledge the entire elementary faculty and staff for their hard work and volunteerism at the elementary school carnival. It was a wonderful event and could not have happened without their dedication. A special shout out goes to the planning committee, Matt Albright, Dana DeBoer, Dulcie Cole, Jillian Wilcox, Melissa Emilio, and Elizabeth Kivet. I saw the photos on Facebook. I couldn't have been here that night, but it looked like so much fun. Yes. Yeah. yeah the pie in the face. On my contact list. Yeah. <laughs> For middle school, um, the middle school is hosting an observer, student observer through SUNY Delhi, and they'll be working with Katie Albright. In the high school, our work-based learning certi certification is renewed for another five years. And we also are hosting some student observers through SUNY Delhi and SUNY Oneana. Terry Sherman will be hosting three students throughout the first semester for her FACTS program. Erin Haight will be hosting one student, and Doreen McGrath will be hosting two students. Um, we, middle school and high school teachers, had the opportunity to participate in a PD on restorative and community circles that was held this month. Teachers are also having the ability and finding professional development offered through NICE, a partnership through NYSED and NYSEGATE on instructional technology resources and learnings so that's specific to their needs. The grading, grading committee held their first meeting of the school year to take a look at our grading practices and making sure that they're aligned within the middle school and high school and the district vision, mission, and goals. Events coming up. In the elementary, oh, that one goes up there. So also in the elementary, they offered five PD sessions so far this school year and another one to be offered this Wednesday. Now to events. Open house for elementary K2 will be October 6th. Open house pre-K and three through five will be October 13th. In the middle school, Music on the Delaware will be held during the day on September 30th for grades 6 through 8 in the high school auditorium. Mr. Lehman will be taking 8th graders to the planetarium at SUNY Oneonta in late October. And Mrs. Bodo is working in conjunction with SUNY Delhi to take students on a hike at the Outdoor Education Center at SUNY Delhi. For middle and high school, the new student luncheon organized by our counselors will be this week. Uh, we have open house also this week. It's on Wednesday from 6 to 7 p.m. And we have staff development day coming up October 7th and then Columbus Day 
that Monday, so it's just a reminder that it's a long weekend. Okay. We have early dismissal October 14th. We'll dismiss at 2.30, about 15 minutes earlier than normal. Spirit Week and preparations for homecoming are taking place, and our homecoming will be Friday, October 14th and the 15th. Picture days are coming up. For the elementary, it's October 18th. The middle school, high school, it's October 19th. And the order forms are, we just got them today, and so we're getting them out to the teachers and in the hands of the parents and guardians. Um, other breaking news, calendars are in. <laughs> yes, yay, calendars are in. And I'll take a minute and I'll go collect one for each of you. But if anybody needs one, they're available in both of the offices or all of the offices in the buildings. And those get sent home. Yes. Right? yes. Yep. Yep. And last but definitely not least, um, on behalf of myself and the other principals, we just want to say thank you to the Board of Education for considering how reports are delivered. And it really means a lot to us, and we appreciate that. So thank you. I had a quick question. Oh, yes. Sorry. Um, the student numbers that you gave us for the, the ins and outs, is that a typical bump? Or I guess yeah. it's a typical September. And okay. those numbers do not include our out of district placements either. Those are just his here on campus in our physical building. Because I don't know that we've been given that information that way before. Mm -hmm. So it just Made me wonder. I appreciate that. I've asked for monthly yeah. updates. Absolutely. Any other questions? The open house was middle school and high school is the same night. Yes. The same mm -hmm. time, same night. Wednesday, the 28th, 6 to 7. Thank you. Now I'm going to roll business office rate tonight. Okay. Um, okay. Superintendent report, Mr. Zimmerman. All right. So I'll start with stuff that um, Carrie would take the report out on. Um, we have been uh, approved by the state for an emergency project to replace the front stairs, the lower front stairs of Grand Ridge Junior Senior High School. Um, the blue stone is in increasing. Rapidly increasing in deterioration, um, and it presents a daily safety hazard to our students and to our guests who come into our buildings. Um, and we're past the point of being able to kind of repair that as it goes. So we applied to New York State and we're approved for an emergency project, which means that we have the ability to move forward in replacing those outside of a capital project that is typically voter approved. So it's not part of a regular capital project. It is an emergency project to replace just those front stairs only. Um, on the agenda tonight, there's a resolution um, to accept the negative declaration of the CEPRA, which is the which basically says there's no environmental impact associated with the anticipated construction. Um, that will be funded out of our current debt reserve. And then that is also aided back, just like any other capital project, at about 73% in the year that follows. Um, that is a typical and acceptable use of that type of reserve, um, especially when it is approved as an emergency project, which we had to demonstrate several parameters to New York State in order for that to be considered um, an emergency project. <clears throat> we have consulted with our architects and engineers at this point to work on preliminary drawings. Um, my recommendation to the board, once those estimates come in, would be to consider going through a co-op um, bid for the work on this project. Um, the company that we most recently engaged in a co-op with for the Terrazzo project over in the elementary school uh, also falls under the same co-op uh, for this type of work. And that would allow us to expedite the, the project and control costs. So as we get more details on that, I will certainly keep you, um, keep you informed of that. Uh, UPK Playground um, is about another week away from, uh, from completion. As far as the tennis courts, the lights are being installed um, this Tuesday, tomorrow. 
Uh, they rolled into town tonight. We are still looking at a soft opening for those courts um, October 1st. And then, uh, but we are holding off putting up the screens because winter's impending. So this spring we do plan to have um, more of a, a grander opening and celebration for those courts. Um, it's also been suggested, wondering if the board uh, would wish to consider um, a namesake for those courts to potentially be named after um, a family who's had a tremendous impact from what I've been told on the tennis program historically in Delhi, uh, the Green family. So that is something that the board wishes to talk about and consider as we get closer to that. Um, I said that I would throw that out there for, for your consideration. Check, 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 check. Um, the New York State School Boards Association is holding their annual conference in Syracuse at the end of October. Um, I have been, uh, I put in a uh, presentation application uh, about last spring and it was accepted, so I'll be presenting at that conference. Also, we have our uh, students from our FFA who will be hosting a student booth uh, at the state conference on our maple syrup production, which is pretty exciting. Um, at this point, both uh, Tammy as our board president and I are registered for that conference. Um, Lucy was asking about that the other day. Um, my past experience has been that the superintendent and board president had attended, and um, at this point, I'm not sure if this is something that other board members will be interested in um, looking into or not. Uh, but I mentioned that, Lucy, if you want to jump in, I mentioned that I would uh, well, mention that. Um, I would recommend um, any of you going to that uh, conference. It's, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're going to the, uh, the law conference the day before. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And so there's, uh, it's generally two days. There's many different workshops to go to. Um, when I've gone, I've always uh, gone opposite of the superintendent or the other board member. Uh, I've always gotten ideas. There's always something to bring back. If you have the time, I would recommend someone uh, interested in going. The dates are October 27th, 28th, and 29th. It's a Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Um, Thursday is that pre-law convention that Lucy's referring to. Um, uh, cost per board member, which we are a member, is $565 for each additional per person. Um, at this point, I not I don't know what um, lodging availability there is in that uh, in the area, but Syracuse is certainly close enough that if anyone was interested in just attending for one day or something like that, you know, it could be something worth considering. Um, so, if interested. Let Tammy know. Tammy will communicate with Lisa. And is that how you want to go about? It? Sure. We'll come here. Check. Couple updates from the New York State Board of Regents. Give me a minute to go out the correct notes on this. At the September meeting of the Board of Regents, they've now made permanent the flexibility to provide remote instruction on days that would otherwise result in emergency closure. Um, this is pretty hot off the press uh, and count those days toward minimum requirements. So if you remember for the past couple of years, this was the snow day pilot. Um, Historically, we have opted to use snow days just as they are intended, and I would recommend that we continue in that case. Um, in the case that those are completely um, expended, this now does give the permanent flexibility um, <clears throat> to move to a remote status in the event of an emergency closure. There are a lot of questions still on this that have not come out yet. I'm anticipating a full uh, Q and the field is awaiting that full Q and A document on that. So as we get more details, 
Um, I will keep you posted. Also at the September meeting, they noted that starting in the 23-24 school year, the districts now must include an emergency remote instruction plan as part of their district-wide safety plans. We have already done that. Um, anticipating and reading the tea leaves that this would eventually be the case, we have already included that in our updated pandemic plan, um, which our team worked on this summer. Uh, again, also awaiting the Q&A on that. I want to, I know uh, that Ms. Trask mentioned dress code briefly, but I want to circle back to that. Um, I've been contacted by a couple members in our community with concerns around our, our current dress code, um, specifically as it pertains to women um, and, and dress and language that is in our current dress code. I've had people contact me concerned that some of the language um, is, is contradictory. In one part of our dress code, we mention the uh, non-discriminatory language that we will not discriminate on the basis of gender, sex, religion, um, gender identity, and, and so forth. And yet there's language in our dress code as it pertains to makeup, hair color, ear piercings, um, uh, spaghetti straps, the, the type of uh, not showing a midriff, uh, and those types of things. So there are advocates um, and concerned parents specifically that after this was explained to students in our opening assemblies that some female students feel that um, that this is discriminatory um, against them and are concerned that they could be being called to task through our dress code. Um, our principals have are currently upholding our dress code and are having conversations with families who they feel um, may be in violation of that. However, there are also some misperceptions that it's being enforced inequitably. I followed up with all of our principals on that, and I can assure you that we are not targeting uh, any particular population as opposed to another, and that, that uh, applies to males and to females. However, I don't disagree that there's antiquated language as it currently exists. So these are the steps the district is taking on that front. Um, as Crystal had mentioned, she's working with our student body, both of our student bodies at the middle school, our Senate at the middle and the high school, to get um, student in, uh, feedback as it pertains to this change. Our principals have also consulted with their colleagues throughout the region to get samples and exemplars of other districts that have already updated and changed their dress code policies for similar concerns. Um, following all of that, uh, then they are also consulting with our faculty and staff on this topic to gain that feedback. Once we have um, a sense of where we may want to go, then we have to hold a public hearing on this before any change could be codified. At that point, our entire community will be invited to come in and engage in a public conversation, question and answers, um, to seek further feedback and input into the development of this uh, updated code before this comes back to the board for approval. So these steps do take time. Um, I know there was a concern that things aren't changing rapidly enough, but we do have to do our due diligence in going through all of these steps. Uh, at the same time, I've been contacted by parents with just the opposite concern, that, um, you know, just concern that we are allowing students to get away with too much. So we are trying to be reasonable, kind of take a middle ground here while holding a same level of accountability for all of our students. So in case you're also hearing concerns in the community, that is those are the steps the district is taking to address um, the dress code. She'd also mentioned our German exchange program. Um, Ms. Trask and I had an opportunity this past week to take the exchange program and a few of our DA students to our capital. Uh, Senator Mark Martucci was uh, uh, Mike Martucci, sorry, was gracious enough to give up a good chunk of his day to personally accommodate us around the Capitol. We got down right onto the Senate floor um, and into the Senate chambers for uh, some great personal questions and answers um, that benefited both our, our German students and some of our DA students. So that was really a great experience. Um, and finally, 
it was also brought to my attention earlier this year some concerns regarding the middle school, specifically the middle school master schedule. Um, as you know, we've been working on a master schedule for a couple of years now, trying to capture um, the needs of many, many uh, factors that go into building a master schedule, uh, whether that be contractual based on um, teacher contracts, numbers of periods per day teachers can teach, um, loads of students, numbers of students that we can put in classrooms, uh, requirements toward graduation, uh, the middle school requirements being different than high school requirements. I could go on and on with a number of factors, uh, special education needs that go into a master schedule. Um, and our goal always has been to expand the greatest number of opportunities for as many students as possible in developing that. And we've come a far, a long way in doing that. Um, but it has not been perfect. And so um, it was brought to my attention was this, I want to say, right when school started, that in middle school, there was a regular core course that was scheduled at the same time as um, elective courses in chorus and orchestra, which resulted in some students not being scheduled into chorus and orchestra, who pre previously were students in those courses. Um, at that point, I had asked our principals, please start looking into this. Uh, <coughs> how many students this is affecting? How did this happen in the master schedule when we talked about that this type of thing, we cannot have these kind of conflicts in the master <coughs> schedule? And so um, about a week later, that was brought to my attention again, uh, the similar concern. And at that point, I brought our middle school counselor into the, into the question. And I um, basically said, I have a solution for this. Uh, part of it was related to numbers of students who wanted to take a particular foreign language as opposed to another. So their attempt to solve one problem created another in another area that I just was not aware of at the time. So in an attempt to remediate that, um, our newer middle school staff started making changes to student schedules. Um, and prior to completing that, had moved a few students um, without parental notification. And when that was brought to my attention, we had a very different conversation. Um, that was not my directive. Um, I think it was an honest mistake by newer staff who were trying to make things right, um, and it's a work in progress. So if you're hearing concerns regarding the master's schedule, that, that's the background down there. Um, as I mentioned before, we are always seeking ways to maximize uh, opportunities for our students um, and minimize the impact. Um, so if you're hearing any other questions or concerns relating to that, please let me know. Uh, Kelly, please, yeah, Laura. Are we doing the master schedule by hand, or do we have a program that is designed to figure this out? First? I would love if there was a program to design okay. to figure that out. Um, and that just simply does not exist. The closest thing is Empower School. And so what we do um, is we can load different combinations into Power School, and it will try to spit out different combinations and loads for us. But it does, it cannot account for all of the singletons when we say that, but this student needs this to graduate, this student now needs this, this many students need to take this. It doesn't have the algorithms yet, and there's nothing on the market that does that yet. Um, and if anyone's aware of something, I'd love to know. Uh, but that, to the degree that it needs to do that in a building that has this many grade levels with the numbers of teachers that teach across grade levels too, it just doesn't have the capacity to do that. We start building master schedule, we start having conversations as early as December, January, um, because it goes back to all of our individual meetings with parents and with students on what is your long-term four-year plan. And so there are a number of different things that we consider going into that. And they work on that. I put tremendous pressure on them to have that for me by mid-April so that we can start letting teachers know by the time June comes around what they will be teaching, their teaching assignments, 
and then we can get schedules out to our students in the summer um, with time to, to tweak and, and bring that back. Um, this particular one went out in the summer, and it, I, I missed it. Um, I mean, in the, in the past um, well, night period, there's always been for those music ensembles. So to schedule a core class like math during night period, I'm concerned about. And I'm also concerned that the majority of those core classes are at the end of the day. And how can we um, fix that? Well, we don't have a majority of core classes at the end of the day. Um, the ninth period situation was an anomaly, and I believe it was an attempt to compensate for the enough, for the extra section of Spanish that we had to include. And it, it sort of becomes a game of Jenga, where you make one switch, and it shifts a number of other things. And I believe that that was what had caused that to shift into the ninth period. And like I said, I missed that. Uh, because typically, you're right, ninth period is open for those uh, learning labs and, and um, ensembles and the like. Uh, did you find a solution for all of the students involved in that? Uh, that's still a work in progress. I can't say that definitively. I don't know that. But they are working on it. My next question is, um, is there a committee that can work with whoever does the master schedule, or does that fall under another committee? And a board member be part of that committee? I would not recommend that a board member be. We don't have a scheduling committee, no. Um, our entire counseling department um, and all of our principals are responsible for scheduling with input from our teachers. It's a year long process. Our principals meet with all of our teaching departments to look at student needs, to determine electives, to determine caseloads, and, and that kind of thing. Um, I would not recommend that, I don't believe that it's the role of a board member to participate in that degree of minutia. However, we can do a better job in keeping the board appraised of the progress of how scheduling is going and the development of master scheduling. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, that's all I had for all of my reports. Any other questions on Sean? I had a question going back to the uh, the process for the dress code. Yes. You said that um, it would at some point be codified. My understanding that's part of the student code of conduct. Yes. So it would that would get amended, which I believe ultimately is board approved. That's correct. So remember when we did the backpack change at the end of last year? Yes. And we approved the same process. So annually we approved that document. Annually we do, and then any amendment to that also then is an amendment. Yes. So that would, if that moves forward, or when that moves forward, yeah. then that would come to this board with correct. a presentation. It would be at the public hearing, I'm assuming, or something. Yes. 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 <coughs> Any other questions? Remind me, what is the code of conduct approved? What do you mean? Typically, I believe it's that to reorder. I think I it's reorder. Yes. And then, but there are other areas within the code of conduct. I'm looking at Crystal that I know that the committee is working on as well, right? Yeah, we're going to start branching out to take a closer look at I couldn't answer. Yes, we're going to start branching out to take a closer look at other areas that need updating. Okay. So any changes we would, <clears throat> we would make and approve would go into effect immediately, basically. Yes. Yep. Policy just the, the policy requires that we have a code of conduct. Um, we used to that. we used to have the printed code of conduct in the policy manual. But the code of conduct itself is not the policy. The policy is just goes insofar as requiring that a district have a code of conduct. Is that right, Bruce? Mm -hmm. And is it it's housed just as its own separate? Yes. Yes. And the only and way changes get made is if the board approves it. That's right. Okay. 
and that's all as per school law. <coughs> Any other questions? Just one more. First, to make a change, any kind of change, you have to have a public hearing. Any substantive change, yeah. Any, uh, any, any change. Well, I mean, change a name, monitor, correct title, no, but if, yes, any, any new policy, change, or, any new policy, certainly anything amending the dress code would require a public hearing and come back to the board. Thank you for being with me. That was a long report tonight. Hey, committee reports. A.L. Kellogg? A.L. Kellogg met um, 9.13. We uh, have lined up three speakers uh, for our mental health series uh, with varying dates of anticipation um, uh, because of their schedule. Three well-known uh, people, anti-bullying, uh, mental health, positive thinking, um, anti-suicide. Um, we also talked about the backpack program and made a donation towards that because uh, the backpack program is non-exclusive to me <coughs> and it's non-discriminatory and it costs approximately $250 a year per student. And right now, uh, on peak, we had 42 students, and now we have 33 at this point. So uh, uh, we did make um, a donation so that it could be sustainable. Um, we were very pleased, uh, as we will find out later in the agenda, that we are still getting organizations to donate, and we do appreciate it, because uh, it is a, a worthwhile program. Um, Anything else? Um, the speakers are going to be uh, doing three presentations each, with the third one being open to the public and anybody mm -hmm. wants to get out to see them. Um, the, this committee is, you know, since we've been having our discussion today on committees, uh, this committee is different than the other committees, being that we do make decisions and vote on them and have actions happen at that point. There's uh, members on this committee from the town of Treadwell representing the Treadwell School District as well. Um, so I think there's five of us. Uh, yeah, the difference is that it's not a board subcommittee, that it's a district committee. Um, and we did. Um, right. Like Lucy said, the backpack program is uh, it is um, donations to the district, and it uh, sends uh, we send food home every weekend for uh, three meals a day for the whole weekend. I believe with that program, so it is an important program. That would supplementing. Okay. Um, the we reviewed um, the numbers for uh, fall sports. It all looks um, pretty good across the board. It doesn't look like anybody's at the, at the line or there, there's not you know, a tremendous number. Modified football does have more than usual. They have 37. Um, but everybody else appears to be in line. Equipment is trickling in. Um, what's been ordered with all the rest of the supply shortages, uh, equipment isn't um, absent of that. Um, then the modifier, the youth teams are all active and using the facilities as they normally do. Everything's up and running. There's even, a, I think, cheerleading this year. Um, there's apparently some youth cheerleaders. Right. That are, yeah. There, so all good. Yeah, I, I totaled up um, the participation, and we have 191 students involved in modified and varsity all sports, which I think is a tremendous number. It's awesome. Um, 
and it was mentioned also about um, SUNY um, basketball uh, offering uh, basketball uh, sessions for our K-6 students for five weeks, 10 sessions, and I think that's off to good start. time talking about uh, our next project that's been in the works for a while. Uh, Carrie and Kelly presented um, three different options, uh, uh, two different options, multiple options, to do a small project and or a larger project that would encompass um, the tech wing, changing the tech wing, wing around to get it more current um, with where our students should be. Um, we very believe we can do this without any additional tax levy to the taxpayers by using uh, reserve funds. And um, we definitely need to pick a date to have a special meeting on this because we're to the point where it needs to be presented to the whole board. So this will be a special board meeting but also open to the public certainly um, for the purposes of starting to conceptualize and discuss the scope of our next capital project. Preferably prior to our next regularly scheduled board meeting, which is the 24th, yes. So the 10th is in the holiday, so it is. I'm not sure how that impacts. Is there a day of the week that's better or not good for people? Can't do Wednesdays. Can't do Wednesdays. Wednesdays. Is it talking? Are uh, thinking about? Well, I'm just wondering if there's days that. Is there? You have some obligations, Sean? Do you have days? Uh, yeah. I've, um, more nice than not. I have some sort of obligation, but the week of 17th opens up. Well, Tuesday the 18th. Good. What's funny? What time works for everybody? Five, six, five. It's five too early for anybody. And what's the date again? One more time. October eighteenth. Um, at that meeting, I'd also like to invite our um, our architects <coughs> to make some preliminary plans for that technology way too. So, um, assuming that they're available, to send somebody. Mm -hmm. We'll go with that date. Finance yeah, committee. Yeah, we um, so we talked about the tennis court project wrapping up, which seems to be on schedule at or below our budget. I don't know if we have final numbers yet. Did we come in and discuss an actual number? Uh, we had rough numbers. Um, I believe it came out. It was definitely under what we had. We talked about this in the capital project too. I don't know if you remember, James. Mm -hmm. uh, it came. It was definitely under where we had that not to exceed seven twenty is sticking in my head for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, but I can confirm that for you. 
Okay, I was going to ask, you know, Carrie, just to, we can do that next time. Yeah, no problem. Um, we looked at the long-term debt in, in the context of a smaller and a larger project. And the reason why the larger project may make sense is really that by the time any project is actually bonded, it'd be out in the 26, 27 year by the time it got approved, constructed, and then bonded. And it really falls quite nicely in with our needs, most importantly, but also the way that our debt comes on and falls off, which would lead to very little impact for the district given where our current debt levels are. So that's a reason why this has to be looked at in more detail, but from a financial standpoint, the first look that Carrie presented looks uh, doable. Um, we also talked about, I know there's going to be some responses on the Kellogg um, Fund Financial Management RFP that we'll put out. We'll probably talk about that um, when he's back, I'm just mm -hmm. I think it was set to be reviewed last Friday. Yeah, he was sick, so, yeah. so we didn't, it's rescheduled for this week. Um, and then we talked about some of the things that you've already gone over, Kelly, but that's about it. Um, right? Anything else? No, we uh, talked about the, the difference, uh, the SROs. Yeah. Cost yeah. But yeah, that was good. One of the committees that has met and is not listed is the newly formed DEI uh, committee, which Lauren and uh, uh, Superintendent Zimmerman and I are on. And maybe Lauren would like to report on that. Yeah, it was our first meeting, um, and it was um, we sort of just we realized that we have to do this uh, educational forum. I mean, it's, it's suggested to do this before we develop the um, diversity and equity and inclusion committee. Um, so once we attend this um, forum, we'll have um, a better idea of the focuses that we, um, or the focus that will be um, in our committee meetings. And we will form a committee that will probably have a teacher or students or parents, board member, this is the and that's, that's it. We want to attend this first so we can get a, a good idea of what we're working on. Deck flyers in everybody's packet. Uh, tonight is the deadline. If anyone else wants to jump in and join us, uh, Lucy and Lauren and I are already registered for this. It's free. It's co-sponsored by DCML BOCES. Um, they are bringing somebody, a specialist, in on, uh, on the topic of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So if anyone else is interested in joining us, let me know, and I'll make a phone call to them. Okay, then we uh, we also, we did have policy committee. We did. Yeah. Oh, they said we didn't. No, yes, we did. Okay. We did. Um, and just briefly talked about open enrollment. Um, again, that it's a discussion item on the agenda for today with no action to be taken, just to kind of keep it as an agenda item so that we can continue to have discussion. Um, obviously, if anything were to be considered, it's something that's going to take some time to uh, analyze and, and review everything that needed to uh, to happen, but anyway, that uh, that's on the that's on the agenda. Um, we had some sample policies, which I think everybody got at the last meeting. Really, wasn't much discussion on our part there. Um, talked about uh, whether or not we would need a policy if we move forward with the school resource officer, and those are not. Uh, required policy and it's actually something that's not recommended that we have a policy as far as that goes um, and again that it is a discussion item 
on the agenda and that we would have the presentations. Um, briefly discussed some of the things that were brought out in the presentations by, by both parties here tonight. I don't think there was anything that we had talked about or wondered about that wasn't discussed this evening. And again, just talked about the changes coming in the dress code policy, uh, policy, so we mentioned earlier, the distinction that policy says we have a code of conduct, but the code of conduct itself is not Policy. Yeah, I know it's, it's not a policy item, it seemed the most appropriate place to involve board members for some comments and actually. Crystal happened to be, she was at the meeting and um, just had some nice banter about the topic. So look forward to seeing what we come up with. Especially knowing with the students being involved with the, um, the backpack mm -hmm. policy. So that was kind of a fun process to watch that all happen and unfold. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what we do with this. Policy, we have no policy review or adoptions for September. And as promised, we will entertain a discussion on the school resource officer position. So this is just another opportunity, um, since if we did start the discussion last time, it can occur again under old business. Um, if there's further discussion, you know, that, that you wish to have at this point in consideration. Um, as we move closer into new business, there is a resolution to actually vote on um, giving me the authority to enter into a contract with one of the two uh, agencies that you saw tonight. If part of the discussion um, you feel that we need to uh, consult with Bruce with specific questions or talk about any names or specific personnel. We will need to break and go briefly into an executive session. Um, but that is at the pleasure of the board. One question, um, and you probably said it, but I'm just thinking after you got done, so I want to ask this. We talked about restraints and hands on, hands look hands off. I know um, you mentioned that that was part of what you were able to do, is that right, in your presentation? Yes, so the juvenile, juvenile law uh, is a little different than adults, they're handled differently. Okay. Can I pause you real quick? Just, would you mind just coming yeah. out? I want to make sure people at home can hear responses to the questions and... Yeah, I apologize for making you say this again, but it was important, I think. Yeah. I just want to get Clarity on both. Yeah. So, in severe cases, police officers can physically detain a child, but it's like severe cases. Otherwise, police officers don't handcuff children at risk of injuries, just like pregnant women. We don't handcuff pregnant women at risk of injuries unless there's a circumstance where they're a danger to themselves or others. And Justin, so is that up to 18 years old? So, at 18, that 18 changes? are adults. Okay, so you would have potentially some seniors that would have different, maybe guidelines Basically. under that law, then. Yeah, the but in the school setting still, mm -hmm. there would be very few circumstances where an 18 year old high school student would be handcuffed here, mm -hmm. unless he was a risk to us, risk to us, or themselves. Yeah, okay. Okay, interesting. And is that consistent with what your practice is? Or? So I do have handcuffs, don't ever plan on using them. Um, same rules apply. You know, we have all the same training. We use our de-escalation de techniques just like any other law enforcement. We're no different when it comes to that part of it. Uh, I will not handcuff a, a child unless those circumstances arise where there's great danger. 
Uh, as far as restraints with our little ones, uh, we go through CPI training, we work with the schools, they train us in that, and we get our updated training through CPI with the, with the districts. So we have that restraint training if that ever, thank God, doesn't come to life, but in case we have to. So handcuffs are one thing, but just so we know what to expect. If you see someone that appears, you know, a student that's out of control or something like that, what would be your, would you sort of physically restrain them yourselves? Or how, how would that, I know you try de escalization Right. That's your first thing, of course. I'm sure you both do that. But what, what would the community expect? How would a, an incident look where someone's out of control? And it's not handcuffs, but other things. And every situation is going to be different. We can do what ifs, so I would need more information. But if we have to go hands on, we are in our right to go hands on. Okay. And at, in my four years, uh, never had to do it. You know, do we physically prompt? walk with them, talk to them, no different than when I've had to escort parents off the property, same exact way we do it. And little ones, again, redirection, refocusing, um, CPI training in case we have to do any kind of restraints, but you know, what we've learned in our careers, we can still use uh, in this capacity. Altercations between students? Just separate, or how, how do you? Usually my voice, Takes care of it. Yeah, that's kind of like you said. Verbal communication works yeah, way yeah. better than anything else. You know. Just as you're approaching, start as soon as you enter the room. It's over. It's done. Let them know you're there as you're walking toward it. You know, if you have to go loud to start, you can always go down mm -hmm. as they stop. Um, you know, and again, yeah. that's the presence of an SRO. That's going to be their mindset's going to be, uh oh, they're here. Let's stop. They don't even on the anything. street. I'm sure you've seen on the street. If someone's having on the street, please show up. A lot of the time it stops because they're like, police are here. We need to stop. It's the mindset of the general normal public. <laughs> so you would expect not really a difference. I'm just, I don't want to speak for you, so this is not the case. Say it. There wouldn't be a difference for how you would approach any of these situations internally or externally. You have the same training. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Okay, so your abilities as a police department are not different than his, than yours. Not yet. We're trying to get here. No, obviously not. Okay. Or do anything same. else with incident management or all that's the same. All the training is the all right, same. Thank you. I wasn't clear. Thanks Correct. for that Sorry. clarification. Yes. Uh, do SROs ever wear body cameras? Yes. Yeah. 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 We do not. Okay. Well, just say like. That's not something you would want to do in the school, right? Okay. <laughs> because of because of purple laws and that kind of thing, you, you we would be we wouldn't want to wear a body camera in a school because now you're basically showing all of the students, which is not something we would want to do. Okay. Thank you. Plus, the staff is against it. We're going into a classroom. None of our cameras are in classrooms. They don't even look in the you know the multi-purpose rooms. But we're and we're implementing body cameras here shortly. We just got them. Our policy is to use as needed. So if a major incident occurred here, we can turn it on. <coughs> so if something occurred, we have the option to turn it on. Otherwise, it stays on. I have a question for uh, Superintendent Zimmerman. Um, is this sustainable if we go this route? Fiscally? Yeah. Um, yes. So I've gone through this um, a <coughs> number of times with Mr. Schultz. Um, our plan is in the first two years, potentially into the third, depending on the timing of funding streams uh, through the ESSER funds um, or the, the federal dollars with COVID. Uh, the first round of funds needed to need to be expended by September of 2023, second round by September of 2024. Um, our fiscal year starting July 1, we could potentially um, encumber two years worth or a year and a half's worth uh, in one of those, by one of those deadlines. And so we could potentially be looking at two, if not three years, completely federally funded. Um, following that, then we would need to be discuss having that discussion as part of our general fund. Um, that many years out, we would be looking at that as part of our regular staffing conversations that we have every year. Um, 
but I don't see why we would not be able to continue this in perpetuity. And have we ever uh, calculated how much it would cost if we did it independently without any outside agency, if we uh, did the liability insurance ourselves, and if we then, um, I've asked the question, um, a direct, so if we did a direct con contract a with a retired uh, law enforcement official, um, that we had just talked about that initially when we had a community member who was retired say, hey, why don't you do a direct contract with me? I can't make more than X amount of dollars. I think the figure was around 35,000 at that time. Um, and then I started researching what that meant. Um, and found out that you would need to still have somebody who has the correct credentials to supervise that individual. Nobody has done that before. Uh, so I don't have hard figures, but you would be looking at essentially paying two salaries for that purpose. And then there is not only the liability insurance right on top of that, but all of the requirements that the insurance company would, we would have to jump through hoops to determine in order to even qualify for that. Um, and it got to a point where it's not been done before and the costs, even just the phantom costs were surmounted. So that immediately took that consideration off the table. And I'm not sure a district employee can carry a sidearm, correct? They cannot, that's correct. So that they another, couldn't employ someone unless, in the district. Yeah, unless, unless well, there were certain provisions through insurance that would right. allow that, but we're talking that's a huge increase to our insurance premiums. Is there any school that actually not carry? No. No one's, no one's in, we do these presentations to the boards all the time. We're very upfront with how we do it. We've never had one say, well, we'd rather have you, but not carry. Um, you're just another target, and you're not really helping anything. So looking at statistics before coming here, briefly, it was somewhere around 5 to 10% of schools nationwide in 2017 asked SROs not to carry, not to be armed. So that's roughly the percentage, it's 5 to 10%. But so that was five years ago. Who is the persons, who here would be the officer's contact for management scheduling, here's what I'm doing, where I'm going, what I'm, I need, you know, that kind of point person, supervisor. We talked about that. It would be me in coordination with the building principals. And I don't know if we got the answer or we asked the question from Del High. Um, if we asked for a, a security officer to go to a basketball game or to go to a special, is that an extra fee that was mentioned? No, so like I said, our schedule's gonna adjust as needed. If, let's say, like Columbus Day is coming up, if they're shorter that week, they can make up the hours staying late. Also, our bill for crews X amount of dollars for cost of overtime to us because we're constantly causing overtime for whatever incidents are happening. So that's predetermined through the village board that it's expected cost to the village or to our department. Thank you. Has anybody ever stopped the service? No. All, all, most, all, all the schools, well, not all, the majority of the schools that we have have added you were at Main Edwell, we had one SRO at Main Edwell a year ago. They now have four. Like Dan said earlier, Green started with one, they now have two. Unity goes asking for another one. So no, so one, has, no one has stopped the service. And same some, for the county's SRO program, they've added. Yeah. They went from being either only in both or only in Sydney, now they split both in Sydney. I also understand that South Corey and Stanford are both adding for the first time this year as well. So, well, I think as long as it's federally funded, and it, then at the end of a contract of either two years or three years, we can make another decision, see, maybe collect some data, and see whether it was 
it, it's worth putting it on our regular uh, budget or not. I, I, I'm in favor of it. Sean, your thoughts? Yeah. I don't think there's any going back on it. Once we have it, we have it. I would assume. Um, but I, I'm in support of it. I think it's going to be a very positive thing. Uh, Sammy, if I may, at this point, if there are no more questions for any of the gentlemen in the room, I'd like to dismiss them because this board is also going to have to decide which way you want to you want me to go. Um, so you know, we don't want to cause any fights here. <laughs> You're certainly welcome to stay. I just don't want it to get awkward. But. Thank you, thank you, both of you, and all of you, uh, and for you. coming tonight for presenting. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. I guess I should ask the question, is anyone opposed to this? Okay. Good. Good. So I think it's in our best interest to make a decision and to move forward so that we can get it implemented sooner rather than later. So are we saying we're being clear that it's a three-year commitment? Well, that's what they're asking. They want to see it as a Or is it a two-year commitment? Don't you say Delta is annually in? They, they are both requesting a three-year, but in my individual conversations with each agency, they said they would relent to a two-year contract. So. Um, depending on the terms of the resolution as the board decides to write it tonight um, and is passed, that's what I will go back to the agency with to say the board has approved, um, have, the board has authorized me to engage in a two-year contract. Is that still acceptable? So, unless unless you want to go three, that's, that's another decision that we'll need to make tonight. Given the use the given the funds that are available, I think the most responsible thing is to do the two. Mm -hmm. If they're willing to do it, I'm not saying we won't go forward and figure out a way to the budget for it, but just I think it's in the best interest of the district to try to match funds with the term of the contract. Mm -hmm. But did you say that you thought you would be able to squeeze three years out of it? We could, there, there's a possibility that we could get creative. It's likely, but I can guarantee to. So if, you, if you're looking for an absolute, I would say two is the absolute. Either option seems to me to be pretty comparable. Right? That there's no outlier that would lead me to, to choose one or the other. Um, there was discussion at some point about a specific person, and I think they were both open to that. Is that so? I have more information on that, but we would have to break it to an executive session yeah, before. Before, before we do that, you mentioned outliers. Um, there were two outliers for me. One was um, the, the chance that our officer could be removed from campus um, with, if it's Delphi PD, um, if there's an emergency locally in the village. Um, the second one was given the 10 month versus the 12 month contract with Delphi PD, we could be in a situation based on staffing that we're looking at one person Monday through Thursday and a second person on Friday. 
not happen, they can't guarantee that consistent person every single day of the week, um, especially if they're not going to engage in a 12-month contract. They would be engaged in a 12-month contract if the village had a need for those other two months and they had to hire somebody for 12 months. If there's only a need for 10 months, they could still provide that, but it would be a quote-unquote conserved part-time at that point. And then we would have whoever is at their dis that disposal. Um, it sounds as though they've made every attempt to make that be a consistent person, but that was more of a question from how I interpreted it. That lead to like a, like a that full-time person going to an unemployment kind of situation? I don't. Uh, no, no, I don't think so. Because they, they have a number of part time staff. Yeah, yeah. You could also, I mean, you could look at the 12 month position having two people coming in and out as a bit of a benefit because you're, the students are going to recognize both those officers on the street. And it's going to give a better. Uh, I can't think of the word I want, but uh, it's going to, you know, be interaction between the, the kids and the, and the local police department. They're going to be more familiar with with uh, who they're seeing. That's a good point. I wonder if one of them ever had to I don't know. Yeah. Uh, would it be wrong to assume that now they're gone, but um, Bell High would have to hire another officer because they're giving up someone that's currently on the street? I don't know. Did you want to jump into a quick executive session? Discussion on the board. It certainly yeah, it requires all the ones of executive session. Yeah, so we need to. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the yeah.
So at this point, you can use the discussion here to inform the filling in the blanks. Mm -hmm. And then um, any further discussion can happen as part of that new resolution. Yeah. Yeah. Motion to go back in. We yes, did. we did. Okay. Yep. Yes. yes. Okay, so we'll fill in the blanks. Um, our preference is to. Oh, James wants to use the next one. Well, I think we can probably second period. period. Yeah. Right? Two year period. <coughs> Suggest in the language of the resolution to have a not to exceed mm -hmm. amount. Mm -hmm. well, they said comparable at they 65. They said between 65 to 70. Dell High PD said 65 to 70. Um, Upstate said 65. So not to exceed 70. We should probably run. Yeah. So. James, we were just filling in the blanks. We filled in the two-year period, uh, not to exceed seventy thousand dollars. Did that say per year? Per year, yep. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. School resource officer services. And is our preference to go with update security? A motion, please, to approve a contract with Upstate Security for a school resource officer to provide school resource officer services to the district for a period of October 2022 through October 2024, not to exceed the amount of $70,000 per year, as decided upon the superintendent and board of education. Authorizes payment thereunder and authorizes Superintendent Kelly and Zimmerman to execute said contract on behalf of the school district. Sean? And a second? Second. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? Okay, Ms. Harry. Thank you for your support. And we'll go back to old business um, for a discussion regarding district policy on non-resident student attendance with no action to be taken. So 
clarifying information. This relates to this, the discussion that's got the topic of athletics back up again. And first question, you don't have to answer this now, but I'm not sure about education law. Is it true education law requires immunizations to be in public school? Or is it Department of Health or Education or both? That's one question. Secondly, is it education law, yes or no, or that homeschool students would have to be immunized in order to participate in extracurricular activities? Participation of homeschool students is governed by our district policy. Currently, our district policy on homeschool students is that they do not access extracurricular or athletic I understand. Activities. If that were to change, would they have to be immunized in order to do that? If the policy were to change, then I believe yes, because athletics are an extension of public school. And in order for students to enroll in public school in New York State, they have to meet the minimum immunization requirements. Check me. Absent the religious exemption. Correct. Yes. Right. Absent exemptions where allowable by law. I believe that if you're homeschooled, yes, it is under the school to decide whether they can join orchestra or other activities. But I believe for athletics, they have to buy. You, um, Seth, you probably have a better memory on this. Isn't for athletics, they by the athletic state uh, board, they have to be a I, member of school, I believe. I thought so, but someone has sent me, and this is why I just wanted to verify we're all on the same page, um, something out of education law, and Bruce and who carry <laughs> Your card, your book carrying is on page, I believe it's 965, non-public schools and home instruction, 32 colon 34-35, under 3235, are homeschooled students subject to the same immunization requirement, requirements as school students attending school? Now, I know that doesn't is this an old? Uh, I don't know. I, I that's why I said I don't want to put you on the spot. We could I just want to put it out there. As those are a few questions that I just want to make sure get clarified. I want to make sure the question is correct because we might need more time to look into that. Yeah. So your first question pertains to if students who are homeschooled wish to participate in athletics, which are governed by the New York State Public High School Athletic Association, uh, required to be immunized. If the policy, if the district policy right. permitted that. Mm -hmm. I mean, school law says a homeschool student will only be allowed to attend state tests or any other activity in a public school if he or she is immunized under public health law other than the medical or religious exemptions. Okay, so the answer to that would be yes. That if our policy permitted participation, they would have to be immunized. Now the question of mm -hmm. what the requirement under the New York State Public High School mm -hmm. Athletic That's Association, normal. I may have okay. to research that because we are governed by their rules and regulations. Thank you. If you could redo that. I can look helpful. into that for you, yes. So would that translate <coughs> that over into Lucy's point that um, play? That's what I need to research to see right. if it's different as per the New York State Public High School Athletic Association. So I believe uh, Mr. Ferrara, uh, Ferrara mentioned that, you know, we just last year it came up, I believe, one of the open sessions, and uh, we just said, even if we change our policy. No, but you were questioning, though, if, you know, not sports, okay, like, oh, sports. right, that if we change our policy, the policy for what other mm -hmm. extracurriculars right. might allow. I, but 
because I know some homeschoolers would love to be on in the orchestra yes. or there. That's our policy. According to this, that's our policy. That right, but even if we changed our policy, the immunization we would still have to still. Correct. The immunization we wouldn't be able to write. Yeah, so for both. So I just want this very clear, though, because there's this is a lot of misinformation. People are sending me pictures of books and stuff. Right now. Yeah, we just have Bruce. It came up last beginning of the meeting before about that policy. And I was under the impression the policy follows the law. They get it. So I, get, I think that's what we're looking for clarification. So Bruce just yes. pointed out a clause in the school law book, which you'll get under additional information, is consistent with what Lucy just mentioned. But it's not referencing the New York State Public High School Athletic mm -hmm. Association. Mm -hmm. It references the Commissioner of Education guidelines. So, as per the regulation, Commissioner's mm -hmm. regulations, um, participation in interscholastic athletics mm -hmm. is not permitted for non-district residents or non um, or homeschool students. Ooh, no, that's the school's policy, though, isn't it? No, no, no there is a separate, separate clause in school law right here. So the policy so, follows that. Or, uh, that that yeah, Trump policy. Uh, that, that's for students who are not enrolled. Not they can enrolled. be non-residents, but if the district will adopt a non-resident policy, then they're considered enrolled. That's true. We're talking about homeschool students. Homeschool students. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
possibly coming at us. I'm not sure. Not sure how school merger actually works. How that would be, but I, mean, I feel like we should be prepared. But we see something like that coming. That takes years. It takes a couple of years. Okay. I would imagine it's going to take some time, but. And, and actually, the trend has been moving more away from mergers and acquisitions necessarily, and more toward conceptualization of regional high schools. Um, those models are, are much more palatable for communities. They allow smaller districts to retain their identity and having a home school, a home, you know, a K through eight or something like that. And then there are destination, more destination high schools, regional high schools. I see that as much more likely or trending in a particular direction, particularly in this region, um, than a straight up merger or acquisition necessarily. But you make a great point. Um, and perhaps exploring something like this would be a good step, at least in, in preparing for that. The same can be said as we are starting to conceptualize our next capital project. Um, you know, that's, that's a, a lens to which to look, look at a lot of things if we're truly looking long term. But um, perhaps I could give Bruce some more homework. <laughs> I mean, I think we've, we've asked a bunch of a, no, a number of questions that we ought to keep yes. track of because we'll yeah. revisit some of those if this conversation rolls on, which I think is good. One I think we might want to look into, and it's more homework for you, but what? What are we actually resourced for in terms of our capacity in, at present day? In other words, um, and I'm not saying we've got to get some algorithms developed to do this, but I'm just saying I'm working with our building capacities, different grade levels, and our census. You know, are we staffed for? Um, we have the capability of handling 200 more people here, sprinkled out as what? You know, is it that we, our middle school is light at the moment? Is it, or not? Is it that when we look at it, we're really not at all uh, because we don't have another XYZ expandability uh, option. So I guess it'd just be interesting to know what if it really is even an option for us. Mm -hmm. What's our capacity? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Someone said, well, yeah, you could, but it's going to be so two more principals, another gym teacher. Plan per pupil expenditure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. With consideration for long-term enrollment projections and trends. And right. We talked about the birth rate yeah. in the county, if we could get a hold of that. Or, I mean, in our school district area, I don't think we can yeah. down like that, but I thought it would help me. After COVID, it might blow up. Thanks, bro. The other end. <laughs> so we'll keep it on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any questions or comments on that topic? Okay. New business. Motion, please, to approve a merger with Walton Central School District for the varsity wrestling program for the winter 2022-2023 sports season due to low player numbers. In some years now that we've done that. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 A motion, please, to approve a request from the Assistant Superintendent for Business to transfer the following excess fund balance to the following reserves. So moved. Second. Second. Lucy, thank you. Any questions or comments? 
Is this from this fiscal year? No, this, this was from 20, 2020 to 2021. Year. Yeah, yeah at, at the close of the current audit, we will be seeking to do again for the current, the past school year. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion is carried. Motion, please, to be it resolved that the Board of Education of Delaware Academy Central School District in Delhi hereby approves an agreement for Ms. Rosary Avila to provide academic intervention services for a period retroactive to September 12th, 2022 through June 30th, 2023. It authorizes Superintendent Delaware Zen to execute said contract on behalf of the school district. So moved. Second. of the Delaware Academy Central School District of Delhi, hereby approves an agreement from Ms. Linda Labor to serve as a subcommittee chairperson to the Committee on Special Education for a period retroactive to September 12, 2022 through June 30th, 2023, and authorizes Superintendent Kelly Zimmerman to execute said contract on behalf of the school district. A second. Uh, thank you. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Any nays? Which is carried. We did our contract with the Global Source Office here. This is the Secret Determination Resolution for the Emergency Capital Project. Board comments. Mr. Hayes, start with you. Another warm welcome to Carter. 
thanks for your participation and your uh, comments tonight. And uh, also a special thank you to all these organizations. It seems like the more and more donations are having, that's terrific. And special thank you to them for doing that, supporting us. That's all. Mr. Yeah. Welcome, Carter. It was really great to hear your thoughts. Very productive. It's been great to get out. This is like such a nice time of year to watch football and soccer and volleyball and cross country, and it's been really nice. There's a lot of DA pride happening, um, and I definitely noticed at away games we were really well represented, so I'm proud of that. Um, and I want to say that um, that music ensembles are very important to the development of children, um, and I really hope that scheduling conflicts um, classes don't happen with that going forward. And that's it. Christy Kelly. Um, received several comments about our hiking trails behind the school, very positive that they were well maintained and uh, they enjoyed them from the community. Um, the second <laughs> I thank everybody uh, who has uh, been instrumental in that, but it's basically having a good beginning of the school year. I know it would require a lot of uh, hard work on um, faculty and staff, and administration, of course. So I thank them. And, uh, it's nice to be getting closer to normal. Yes, it is. Trustee Tucker? Thank you. Um, just ditto my fellow board members' comments. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Mr. Jacks? No comments. Okay. I just wanted to say that um, our agenda protocol isn't accurate on our website. It does say that um, if you want something on the agenda, it you know, has to be by the Tuesday before. But then it says if you want something read, contact Lisa. And I don't, I, I'm not sure that we're leaving anymore. And, One and then, two. but it doesn't say if you want something on the agenda to email Lisa. It says if you want something read. So that's not clear. Um, and then, what part of the website is that on the The board agenda, agenda. the board agenda. Uh, and then there's board, um, it does list our board meetings, and underneath it says uh, that the superintendent and or the board president will review uh, agenda information and decide what goes on it, which is accurate, correct? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't, there's, our protocol is not accurate. If, if you want something uh, to the agenda, you're supposed to email Lisa, correct? Not yeah, it's something that, that. That's all. Okay. Says if you want something read, um, and that leads me to ask, are we reading? Other comments? That might, it may have been carried over from COVID when, when we were doing that, I'm guessing. Okay. But yeah, Lisa, can you make notes of here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's look into that and make sure that's accurate. Mm -hmm. Please, by like these places, you have occasionally read comments about Particularly um, contentious issue. Right. I can expect people to share. You could say upon special request or special, depending on your service, they have service or something. Well, not everybody thinks they're a service. Well, well so, but you have. Have allowed it, but it's within your discretion whether to do that. Right. Well, I think the concern was that it was just too easy to say, oh, here, read this at the meeting for me. I don't have time to go. Um, and I think the thought process was that, well, if it's out of Florida, you know, we would, would like to have you here. 
the warrants plan just states that if you want something red. Right, and, and we did say that. We did say that up until about, what, two months ago, maybe we changed our but it agenda. Say if you want something on the agenda like that, it's the link to board docs. It's under board docs, not under the district website. I think that's what you're referring to. I was actually just looking at board agenda, board meetings, and I tried it all over and couldn't find an accurate. Now, when you click agendas, it goes to board docs. It says regular meetings. Deadline for items to be placed in the board agenda is the Tuesday prior to each board of education meeting. If you'd like something read during public comments, please contact the district clerk or email her. Yes. Um, yeah, that is carried over from COVID, and they probably didn't catch it because it's on the board. It's on the board docs link. Right, which and is not a website. Which is not right. right. So will you contact board docs to yep. fix that? Thanks for catching that one. And then our upcoming meetings are the just scheduled special capital project meeting on the 8th yes. at 5 o'clock. And our regular Board of Education meeting then on Monday, October 24th, 2022 in the High School Media Library Center at 5 p.m. It is anticipated that the board will convene an executive session at 5 p.m. and return to open session at 6 p.m. The deadline for items to be placed on the board agenda is the Tuesday prior to each board of education meeting. If you have questions, please contact the district clerk at 607-746-1306. And we will not be having another executive session, so I will take a motion, please, to adjourn the meeting. So, <laughs> 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 I've got choices. I've got so many choices. Are we all?